There are three terms that are thrown around when we're discussing audio and computers that all look similar but mean very different things. Sample rate, bit depth, and bit rate. In this video, I'm going to explain what each of these terms mean and how they impact your experience as a person who makes or listens to audio on a computer. When we're talking about computer audio, we're talking about a fundamentally analog phenomenon, sound, and representing it in the digital framework of a computer. So before we get started on computers, let's just take a moment to review sound. What is sound? Sound is very simply air pressure waves that travel through the air or some other medium. Often we'll see sounds represented as a sine wave like this, though unless you're listening to a pure sine tone from a computer, it's usually more complex and interesting than that. Also, it's worth remembering that despite this depiction, there's nothing that's necessarily left, right, or up, down about sounds. The vertical axis is relative air pressure. At the highest point of the curve, the air pressure is pushing in on your ear, and at the lowest point, it's pulling in the other direction. The distance between those extremes to the middle is the amplitude, and our brains perceive it mostly as the loudness or intensity of a sound. Notice that the wave starts to repeat itself, and I could theoretically draw this wave on forever and ever and ever. Each of these repetitions is one cycle or period of the wave. The number of times it repeats per second is called the frequency. We measure frequency in hertz, and our brains perceive that as pitch. You're probably familiar with the 440 hertz tuning note A that is standard in most U.S. ensembles. One thing I want to point out here is that that wave is continuously curving. There's never a point where it sits still, and we'll come back to that in just a moment. If we want to capture a sound in a computer, the first thing we need to do is to convert it to electrical signals, and that's the microphone's job. It has a little magnet inside that gets pushed back and forth by air pressure waves, just like the parts of your ear get pushed back and forth. That motion creates a small electrical current. Now that's still an analog electrical signal, but we're one step closer. Next, our analog signal is converted to a digital one by the audio interface of a computer. This is the audio or analog to digital conversion. And this is where the magic happens. It's the part that I'm going to focus on for most of this video. You may use an audio interface or an analog to digital converter that's inside the computer that's built in, or you may use an external one that you connect via USB or something like that. Digital computers, as you know, have to convert everything to ones and zeros. They don't have anything in between. Because of that, they don't really have a great way of representing gradual changes like we might want to use to represent a sound wave. And I'm sure you're already familiar with how this limitation affects images, so I want to start with that as an analogy. This is a digital representation of a drawing that has curves. At this scale, it looks curvy to our eyes. There's even a subtle, continuous change in color, but that's just a trick of your brain. If you've ever tried to enlarge a photo, you know that if we zoom in far enough, we see that there's nothing curvy about it. It's just a bunch of perfect squares. In the world of images, we call those squares pixels. And if we make those pixels small enough, we get the illusion of a curve. The resolution of an image is the number of pixels that make it up. The higher the resolution, the closer it looks to the real thing. In this case, the closer it looks to the original drawing. The same is true of digital audio. The higher the resolution, the more faithfully the computer can represent the sound as it is captured by a microphone. The resolution of an image is pretty straightforward because the vertical and horizontal axes are both measuring the same thing distance in pixels, but that's not the case for audio. Let's talk about how we deal with resolution in that world of audio. We'll start with the horizontal axis of that waveform graph from earlier, which as we said, represents time. To record a sound, the computer needs to take a snapshot of the amplitude of the incoming wave. Each of those snapshots is called a sample. 
and the rate at which those samples are stored is called the sample rate. Sample rates are measured in samples per second. You can see that after I remove the sine wave, the sample points still look like a smooth curve. We can see and still imagine where that curve was, but that changes as the sample rate goes down. Notice how when I remove some of the lines representing each sample, the wave looks less curvy, and this is what lowering the sample rate does. If I remove even more samples, now the wave could be more triangular and pointy. The higher our sample rate, the more accurately our digital data represents the acoustic sounds. The lower our sample rate, the less likely it is to sound like the original. As you might imagine, when we're describing sound wave frequencies that cycle at thousands of times per second, the sample rate needs to be pretty fast. So how fast does it need to be? Well, for that, we turn to the Nyquist theorem, which states that the highest frequency that sampled audio can describe is roughly half its sample rate. When you think about the, the shape of a sine wave, this makes sense. We need to record the highest and lowest points of the pressure wave. So if our sample rate was 880 samples per second, we could record a sound up to about 440 hertz, which is the A in the treble clef that you might use to tune. Obviously, that's not high enough. So for a good recording, we'd expect to be able to capture any frequency that a person could hear. Now, obviously, each of our bodies is different, but when you are born, like most babies, you could probably hear sounds from around 20 hertz at the low end to around 20,000 hertz or 20 kilohertz at the high end. And like most other parts of our body, it begins deteriorating right away. So if you're old enough to follow along with this video, you almost certainly cannot hear 20 kilohertz tones anymore. Sorry to be the bearer of bad news. So if we wanted to record frequencies of 20 kilohertz, we'd need a sample rate of at least 40,000 samples per second, or 40 kilohertz. Notice that it actually uses the same measurement as audio frequency. So we measure audio frequency in hertz, we also measure sample rates in hertz. The standard sample rate for CD quality audio is 44.1 kilohertz, 20 kilohertz doubled, plus some wiggle room, which we need to account for phasing and other real world issues that are topics for another video. If you do much work with film or video, you might also see a lot of 48 kilohertz sample rates. And that's because 48,000 is an even multiple of the most common frame rates, 24 frames per second, 25 frames per second, and 30 frames per second. All right, so we've said that in CD quality audio, we're storing the amplitude of the sound wave 44,100 times every second. The question now is the resolution of the vertical axis. How many levels of difference do we need between the highest and the lowest points of the sine wave? The answer to that question is described by bit depth, not to be confused with bit rate, which we'll return to in a moment. Bit depth is a bit geekier and more abstract than sample rate. Don't pass out. If you imagine the distance between the highest and lowest amplitudes that our equipment can capture, bit depth describes how many pieces we break that distance into. So the higher the bit depth, the more detail we can capture. We measure bit depth by how many digits of binary are used to describe the amplitude of the sound. I told you it was geeky. A standard CD uses 16-bit audio, which means there are two to the 16th levels of dynamic change that it can store. So that's 65,536 levels of difference, which is pretty high quality. But as computers have gotten faster and storage has gotten cheaper since the CD audio standard was defined all the way back in 1980, it's very common to see hardware that is capable of greater bit depth today. The next step up is 24 bits, which may not seem like a lot more than 16, but remember that this is an exponential scale. So we're going from two to the 16th to two to the 24th, which is over 16.7 million levels 
up from 65,000 that we saw with 16-bit audio. How much resolution is enough? Well, that's kind of difficult to say. As a listening world, we're far from consensus on the matter. You will find a lot of high resolution or high definition audio evangelists in the music world who argue that even higher sample rates are important because they can capture frequencies that, while you can't literally hear them, might affect the way that you hear lower frequencies. And high-end audio devices can play back at a sample rate of 192 kilohertz and 24-bit depth. While some might say this is the best way to listen, others might say that those people are simply justifying the money they spend on listening gear with little or or no appreciable difference in sound. As with so many things, the truth is probably somewhere in between. I know this probably makes me a bad audio nerd, but I don't feel very strongly about high resolution audio either way when I'm listening. But I will say that when I'm recording, and this is what I recommend to you, if your gear can handle the higher resolutions, again by high resolutions here I mean sample rate and bit depth, it's worth trying to capture them. You can always downsample later, and having that extra data allows you to be more flexible with editing and mixing. Now that we've discussed the way that computers describe audio signals, I want to talk a bit about how they store audio in files. The uncompressed audio file is just a big table that says what each channel's audio level is defined by the bit depth at each sample. So for example, it might say at the first sample, the level is 579, at the next sample, the level is 610, and so on and so forth. This is called an uncompressed audio format. The two uncompressed audio formats you may know are WAV and AIFF. As the name uncompressed implies, these files can take up a lot of space, and that's where we turn to compression. Data compression, not to be confused with dynamic compression, which is an unrelated topic, means encoding the same ideas using less data. When we all agree on a set of rules for how we reduce the data and then reassemble the full idea on the other side, we've created a compression algorithm. A very simple example of a compression algorithm is postal abbreviations. When I abbreviate Virginia as VA, you know exactly what I mean because of our shared vocabulary of abbreviations. There's very little chance that in the context of geography, we would lose any information through this compression algorithm. This is an example of lossless compression. I've removed a lot of letters, but the meaning remains unchanged. On the other hand, consider the conversational abbreviation IMHO, which you might see in a text message or on Twitter. Do you see this and think, in my humble opinion, in my honest opinion, or something else? In 2018, BuzzFeed ran a poll about this in which they discovered the extent of the disagreement on what the H in IMHO stands for. This is an example of lossy compression. Some information may be lost in translation between you and me when I use this abbreviation. This same thing happens with data compression of audio files. We have some lossless compression formats, the most common of which is FLAC, F-L-A-C, the L stands for lossless. FLAC files tend to be smaller than uncompressed WAV or AIFF files, but they're larger than files that are compressed with a lossy algorithm. The most common lossy format is, as I'm sure you know, MP3. We saw what happens with lossy compression in text abbreviations. Some specific information was lost, but the general idea of in my humble opinion and in my honest opinion are very similar. Similar enough that you and I could use them differently in the same conversation and be completely unaware of the data loss. In lossy audio compression, the goal is to remove the parts of the audio that we're unlikely to notice, such as the highest or lowest frequencies, which may be just on the edge of our hearing. Another thing we might lose are very subtle changes in dynamic level or timbre. If they're close enough, it will save disk space to just treat them as identical. How much data you're willing to use to store each second of audio is our last number for this video, bit rate. The bit rate 
says how much data the compression algorithm is allowed to use per each second of audio. For MP3s, these tend to be around 128 kilobits per second, up to a maximum of 320 kilobits per second. Smaller numbers mean more compression, which means smaller files and lower audio fidelity. Which data gets thrown out, simplified, or changed depends on the specific compression algorithm that's used. MP3 is the most common, but you may also be familiar with Apple's AAC lossy compression, which you might get if you purchase a digital download from the iTunes store, if that's a thing people still do, or stream Apple Music. This means that an MP3 file compressed at 256 kilobits per second will actually be different than an AAC file at the same bit rate, which sounds better or more faithful to the uncompressed audio is somewhat subjective and, and may even depend actually on the details of the original uncompressed audio file. I would love to play some examples here so you can hear the difference between compressed and uncompressed audio, but that's not possible because the audio on YouTube videos is also going to be compressed. You'll have to seek out some examples on your own. I wanna end with some practical thoughts. When you're listening to music or audio, find the highest quality that gives you the best experience for your equipment. For the equipment I'm most frequently using and the situations that I'm most frequently listening in, 320 kilobit per second MP3 is plenty. However, there is still a lot of value in keeping high quality sounds around for when you're doing focus listening on a dedicated system. And especially if you're a creator, if you're recording or mixing or editing, who knows what compression algorithms are gonna be popular in five or 10 years. And you can always have that uncompressed version to come back to. When you're making things out of audio, it's very important to keep the audio uncompressed and at the source's original sample rate and bit depth as long as you can. Only apply lossy compression at the very, very end. Once lossy compression is applied, that data isn't coming back.